Well, church, we, we got a lot of ground to cover today. We, we really do. If, if you were part of the Bible reading plans, we're going through these, um, and you, you kept up, you realize there's a lot that we're going to cover. So um, let, let's go ahead and pray, ask the Lord for wisdom, and then we're going to kind of dive right into our text this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you give us wisdom as we study your word this morning. May we take the teachings and the lessons from 1 John, Lord, and, and apply them and be more like Christ, have more confidence in Christ, have more assurance in Christ. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, church, we are wrapping up the epistle of 1 John this morning. So this is week 10, so we've been working through it for 10 weeks, so we're going to wrap it up this week. Um, and usually the way we, we read our text is we, we read the whole text we're going to work through this morning, and then we, we stand up for that, and then we sit down, and then we begin to go back and revisit pieces of it as we begin to work through it verse by verse. This morning, because it's such a long text, and, and I know that you guys don't want to be in here for 55 minutes, um, so we're, we're going to read a chunk of it all sitting together, and the others we'll go back to, and we'll just kind of read them. You can stay in your seat as we, as we kind of hit those chunks moving forward. So if you would, please stand with me. We're going to read 1 John 5, 1 through 5, standing, and then you all be able to have a seat. 1 John 5, 1 through 5. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who's been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who then is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Church, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the Word of God stands forever, and this is His Word. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. So there are three major divisions in our text this morning. We're going to work through 1 John 5, 1 through 21. There's three major chunks. The first has to do with the nature of our faith, and that's what we read just now. The second, verses 6 through 12, have to do with the knowledge of our faith. And the third, 13 through 21, has to do with the, what we're calling kind of the festival of our faith, the celebration of our faith. So let's look at the first section, the nature of our faith. Um, one could summarize the previous chapter in John, so 1 John 4, um, by saying that Christian love is orthodox, which means it's grounded on a right understanding of Christ, right? It's active. It's something that we give to one another, this love of Christian love, right? And it's assuring, right? It's the fruit of this love testifies to your status as children of God. And in verses 1 through 5 this morning, which are, which are focused on right now, uh, without completely detaching from the theme of love, John is going to turn our attention to a theme that's no less foundational. He turns to faith. And so in verses 1 through 5, we're going to look at the nature of faith. We're going to see these three aspects of this nature, the object, the author, and the effect. So look at me at verse 1 again at the object of our faith. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. Christian faith, John is telling us, begins with the object of our faith, Jesus. Right? So Christian faith begins with believing that he was who he proclaimed to be, and that was testified about who he is, is true. And all this is very critical for us, right? The object of our faith really, really matters, right? All religion all religions do not end up in the same place. Allah, Buddha, Jesus, they don't all represent some same path or different paths to the same divine truth. The object matters. And I've met countless people in my life who um, would say they have a strong faith, but the faith isn't in Christ. It's, it's in some spiritual ether. It's um, some religious experience where they felt close to God. That's an important piece for us. Um, faith isn't an emotion, right? Like, that's an important piece. Like, faith isn't an emotion. I think we could maybe say it's like a state of mind in a sense, right? And the state of mind requires an object for that state, an object of attention. And so John says this. He says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ, that's the object, is, has been born of God. And according to John, the nature of Christian faith is found tied to the object of our faith, Jesus Christ. And when we go back to this concept, we've been hitting it over and over through the whole study, 
orthodoxy, right doctrine, correct doctrine, it matters. It matters significantly. So there's the object of our faith, Jesus Christ. Next, in the nature of our faith, we look at the author of our faith. So Jesus is the object of the Christian faith. Who's the author of the Christian faith? Who's the source? For many in today's culture, the answer would be something like this. It's, it's me. I'm the source. I'm the one who makes the decision, the one who weighs all the options before me, the one who prays a prayer and asks to be baptized. And, and look, well, on, on one level, we can say that there's, there's truth in that. I don't actually know if that's how John would probably answer this question, right? I don't actually think it's how John would answer this question. Um, look at me again at verse one. He says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. Everyone who believes has been born of God. All right, my Mississippi's gonna come out. Are y'all ready for some grammar? Y'all ready for a little, little grammar here? Okay. Just like the birth of a child comes before the child's first word, so spiritual birth comes before belief. The word believes, or in, in the Greek, it's more literal, I'll put it back up here, is uh, the one believing, right, um, is in the present tense. Okay, present tense, this is, which communicates a present continuing activity. That's present tense, okay? The word for born, more literally, has been born, which you have translated there, has been born, is what we call a perfect tense, which simply means that it's a past action with continuing consequences, Okay, past action with continuing consequences. So let's put it together. The one believing now that Jesus is the Christ has been past events with continuing consequences born of God. See what's happening there? Believing now has been. In other words, this is the Greek method, because that's what this is written in. This is the Greek method of grammatically explaining causation. Right? This is causation, meaning that the author of faith is God, who does a work so that we might be born again, made able to have faith in the object of our salvation, Jesus Christ. So there's a real brief kind of ordo salutis, the order of salvation for you in today's, in today's sermon. It's, it's not me and my mind that enables me to accept Christ. It's the Father's loving action, his authorship, his renewing of the heart first that allows faith. And with those things being done before, look at the first half, last half of verse one. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. If you believe Christ, if you've already been born of the Father, and as such, you are a Christian who has faith now, you are called to love everyone, everyone who has been born of him as well. And, you know, one of the areas that we can get a little, a little picky with in our, in our religious, you know, our denominational kind of things is to really, like, denomination bash the other guys, right? Like, well, those Methodists believe, like those Baptists believe, right? Like, we got to have these. And, and it's, it's really a way of taking some shots at times. Look, we have our distinctions. We have our things. We have areas where everyone thinks the other guys are off or missing something, but I don't think we would necessarily say that they have fallen out of being children of God. Right? I mean, and there's, and there's an important thing here. Like, just because someone can have a different theological thing, if they're, what I love about the EPC, if you're consistent on the essentials of the faith, the orthodoxy of the faith, what is it to be a Christian? Then I think we all have to look around and realize that we're called to love them. Right? Not take shots, not make our parting hits, to love them. Right, That's the call of the church, to love all those who are born of God, whether they are Baptist friends down the street or Methodist friends or whoever. And so John's going to take this concept of faith, this idea of loving through faith, and he's going to transition to the effects of faith. So we've seen this object of faith, Jesus, the author of faith, the faith, the Father, and now we come to the effects of faith. Look at me at two, verses 2 through 5. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who's been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that, G that Jesus is the Son of God? And it's interesting, um, the effects of the proper object and the proper understanding of the author is obedience. Did you catch that? The effects of faith 
obedience, the one who keeps his commandments. Right? And so we get, it, 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 there's a thing that goes through culture that tells us that it's, it's a relationship and not a religion. Have you heard that? Like, like faith, it's a relationship, but you know, it's not really a religion. Um, and, I, and I have some news for you. While it is a relationship, it's a religion, right? I mean, there, we, we kind of lose the holiness of God in that aspect, right? We kind of lose the set-apartness of God. Um, there's definitely relational aspects in how the Christian walk and how we understand God as our Father. That's definitely a huge part of the way that we are under, to understand it. But we're never to forget that God is a holy God, right? And we worship a holy God that demands to be treated as a holy God, right? So we're called to obey the commands. So in verse 2, John says, how do you know you love the children of God? You keep God's commandments. You obey God. That's how you love the children of God. You obey God. And in verse 3, he says, for this is God's love, that we keep the commandments. So church, here's the reality. If you let the world tell you how to live a God-pleasing and neighbor-loving life, you will quickly find yourself striving against God's law, right? You will find yourself coming up with ideas of what love in your neighbor looks like that are not found in the Scriptures, you'll find yourself actually in disobedience. You're not going to find yourself in obedience. What he says is you want to know how to love, you obey the commands of the Father. So we are to read this Bible. We're to, you know, one book says we're to eat this book. You know, Moses says that this Bible, these words, it tells the people on, on the plains of Moab, they are your very life, right? That is the calling of the Christian, to live those words, to eat those words, to obey those words, And if you do these things, you will love the children of God. If you obey God's commands, you will be someone loving his other children, right? You won't be able to help from doing so. And so the reality is John calls us to start with orthodoxy, right? John says, start with proper doctrine, and then everything else falls in line. What a lot of people want you to do is start with everything else and work your way to proper doctrine. And John says, that's backwards. That's backwards. At the end of verse 3, John says, keep his commandments. They are not burdensome. That's that's an interesting line there. We have to be careful. Um, It doesn't mean that they're easy, right? That's not what that means. It doesn't mean they're easy. Those are not the same thing. Not burdensome and easy are not the same thing. Rather, it means that they are for our good. Something that burdens you is something that weighs you down, that makes your life miserable. They're not burdensome. Therefore, are good. Look at verse 4 with me. For everyone who's been born of God overcomes the world. Remember those born of God are the ones who obey his commands, right? Everyone who's been born of God has overcome the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. The commandments are about overcoming the world, not through actions, but through faith. It's not legalism. It's not a works righteousness. It's works that you do because of your faith. Friends, you don't come to church to overcome the world. Like you come to church because your faith in Jesus and his work on the cross draws you to the people of God, right? That's why you come to church. The effect, the result, make could say maybe, is that we overcome the world. The faith leads to actions that overcome, right? You don't resist sin to overcome the world. You obey God's commands through faith. And in doing so, you resist temptation and you are overcomers. Do you see the order? It really matters. There's a nuance there that's critical. Overcoming is the fruit of faith. Overcoming is the fruit of faith. It's, it's not the goal. I mean, it's, it's, part, it's all part of it. In the same way that faith in Christ isn't about just merely getting to heaven, it's about being with the person you love, right? The God you love, the God you worship, that relationship. So there's a relationship to it, right? Faith is the goal, and without faith, there's no overcoming. John goes on in verse 5. He says, who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. He's making a very strong case. Faith equals victory. Orthodox, orthodoxy equals victory, we might say. We overcome by faith because, and we obey because of faith. And the commandments are not burdensome. Doesn't mean they're easy, but they're for our own good. They're for our own good. And so we're called to obey with joy, knowing that the result will end in overcoming. We're called to love with joy because it's the fruit of our faith that leads to assurance and confidence. And so we have this object, Christ the author. We have, um, we have Jesus Christ. We have the author, God the Father, and we have the effects, obedience 
of the Christian laid out before us. So these, these three things summarize this nature of our faith. And now we're going to move on to the knowledge of our faith in 6 through 12. Look at me at verses 6 through 8. This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree. Anyone else maybe slightly confused there? Okay. This is one of the most debated uh, portions of John's epistle here. Uh, and, and I don't have to tell you, um, I don't have time necessarily to tell you all the things that it, it doesn't mean, because there's a whole lot of different ways people have worked through this. Um, I can tell you what I believe it, it does mean. One of the heresies in John's day, we're, we're, we're dealing with um, a, a heresy we might call adoptionism. Uh, and it's, it was put forth by this guy named uh, Serentius, maybe it's most popular, popularly. Um, and, and the view claimed this. It claimed that Jesus became the divine son of God at his baptism. So when the spirit comes down, that's when he becomes the son of God. And then he's the son of God as he does his ministry right up until his death on the cross. At that point, the spirit leaves him and abandons him. Okay, so, so he's like this adoptionism, adopted time where he's the son of God. And this creates a host of problems, right? I mean, just it, it, not even counting the text and all the areas you can see this from birth, it's a host of problems. It affects how we understand original sin, divine sacrifice, the atonement, propitiation. All of these things fall apart. And so John, in verse 6, he's clarifying something. He's saying this son, this object of your faith, he was the son of before his baptism, the water testifies to it. All the way through his crucifixion, the blood testifies to it, right? So the, the two things that testify to the sonship and the deity of the son to authenticate his claim, but in addition to that, the spirit himself testifies to this, right? And so in the Jewish economy, a credible source consisted of two or more witnesses. You have two or more eyewitnesses to have a credible uh, uh, legal case in court. And what John does in verses seven through six is he says, guess what? Seven through eight, he says, we have two witnesses. We have the, the water. We have the blood. Oh, and guess what? We have a third. We have the spirit. And later he's going to say, and guess what? We have the father who sends the spirit. He's building this amazing case as to this is credible, right? This is not only do we have these physical things we can look at that testify to these events, but we also have the divine himself testifying to the sonship of Christ, the divinity of of Christ. And so we have this sure testimony, this sure testimony regarding the object of our faith, despite what the Corinthians may say or anybody else, right? That's what John is working through right there, the water and the blood and the spirit. Let's keep going, 9 through 12. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater, for this is the testimony of God that he has borne concerning his son. Whoever believes in the Son of God has a testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he's not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his Son. And this is the testimony that God gave us, eternal life. And this life is in his Son. And whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. So if the testimony of men is good, John says, Testimony of God is greater, right? Testimony of men is good. The divine is greater. The Father and Spirit agree concerning Christ. It's an overwhelming case. John says, you know these things. You know them to be true because of the water, because of the blood, because of the Spirit, because of the Father. The proof is just unbeatable. It's undeniable. Look back at 10. Look what he said there. Whoever believes in the Son of God has a testimony in himself. Whoever doesn't believe God has made him a liar because he's not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his son. John says if you believe, it now means that you can testify. You're added to this host of witnesses, to the authority of the son. You can testify. It means that you trust the true testimony of the Father and the Spirit. And those who don't believe, they call God a liar. In other words, if I were to tell you right now that this building is on fire. There's a raging inferno happening in these offices back here, and it's sweeping this way really quickly, and none of you moved. You'd be calling my testimony and me a liar, 
right? You, you disbelieve the testimony that I'm bringing to you, right? This is the same kind of thing. Church, it's, just, it's really kind of, it's really important for us to, to grasp this concept, concept to um, those who deny that Christ is Lord. They're not neutral spectators in the world, right? Do you see what John's laying out there? Their denial of Christ, by definition, means that they are calling God a liar. Do you see that? So you are either calling God truthful or you reject it and call God a liar. Those are your options. That's what's laid out before you. It says that God is a false witness to the person of Christ, that the blood and the water are false witnesses to Christ. It says that Christ himself is a blasphemer, which was the charge the Pharisees labeled against him. It's a heavy charge to levy. John says in 11 through 12 that this is the testimony. Here it is, eternal life. This testimony, eternal life, found only in his son Jesus, the object. And if you have the son, you have life. Here's what John wants you to hear. Is this dichotomy between where a man finds life and where a man finds death. That's what John wants you to know. There is life and there is death. There is nothing in between. In Christ, there is life. Outside of Christ, there is death. So John has told us where to find life, but he's also told us how to find life. It's in Christ. How do you find it? Faith alone. It's in faith alone. Eternal life is found only in the person and work of Christ, the object of our faith. And through the rebirth of our soul, the author being God. And the proof is seen in our obedience and love for one another. All of this has to do with the nature of faith. And this knowledge of this nature is trustworthy, John says, because it's the testimony of the life of Christ. His baptism, his crucifixion testifies this claim, but even more so is the Holy Spirit, the inner testimony of the Spirit sent by the Father. This is the knowledge of faith for our assurance and our confidence to stand strong against temptation. So the nature of faith and the knowledge of faith made clear. We come to our final major section here, what we call the festival of faith or the celebration of faith. Look at me at uh, 13 and 14. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he will hear us. So John says, I write these things that you will believe, that you will have, to you who believe that you will have confidence in your eternal rest, in your eternal life. And then we kind of get to something that could be a little tricky, right? Uh, we get this, this, this verse that says, having confidence, anything you ask of him, he will hear, and since he hears, he'll give it to you. What do we do with that? Um, I, is, he saying that is he saying that with enough faith and confidence, God will answer all of our prayers, give us whatever we ask, I've had a lot of prayers in life that have not been answered the way I would like it. I don't know about you guys, a lot. So am I lacking faith? Am I just misunderstanding something? And I think at first read verse 13 and 14 probably isn't very controversial. If you're a child of God, he hears your prayers. We go, yeah, of course. Child of God, he hears your prayers. We can all agree with that. But there's these four words toward the end of that verse that really are the key to understanding this. Look at me again at verse 14. And this is the confidence that we have toward him. Here's our confidence. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Okay, do you see that? According to his will, that's the key. That's the key to not abusing this verse. Now I can't preach this one in a few weeks, right? It's the key to not abusing the text. So remember those four words. Keep those in mind. According to his will, let's go to 15. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we, we ask, according to his will, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. So if we ask anything that is according to the will of the Father, and we know that he hears us, of course, because we're his children, and we're asking it in accordance with his will, then he will answer those requests. And suddenly... The verse isn't about having enough faith, right? It's it's not about not having enough confidence so that God doesn't decline your requests. It's about our wills being aligned with the will of the Father. That's what it's about, our wills being aligned with the will of the Father. And it helps shape our understanding of prayer, doesn't it? Probably challenges maybe the popular understanding or belief of how we understand prayer. 
Prayer isn't about convincing God or persisting enough that he bends to your requests. It's about aligning your will with the will of the Father. It's about learning to rest in dependence on him so that as the storms of life come, you have what John has been so worried about and so concerned about hammering into the heads of this, the readers of this letter. You have confidence and assurance in the Father. When your will is aligned with the Father's, you have confidence and assurance. In other words, our prayers don't determine God's decisions, but they do develop our relationship with him. Right? That's important. So John's going to illustrate this concept for us now. Look at me again at, uh, look at me at 16 and 17 here. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin that does not lead to death, he shall ask, and God will give him life. To those who commit sins that do not lead to death, there is sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that does not lead to death. Another fun one, right? Yeah. Setting aside the issue for just a moment of sin that leads to death, let's just set that, put that right here for a minute. Let's look at the kind of prayer that John says God does answer, that God will answer, right? He says, it's one for a brother who's fallen into sin, right? That word brother is a fellow Christian, someone who's truly been saved, right? Someone who's fallen into sin. John's already told us in 1 John 3, 9 that one born of God will eventually return to him. He can't keep on sinning. He's a new creation, right? He will come back. The Father doesn't lose his own. And so John states um, prayers for a true child of God, someone who has slipped into sin, who has embraced temptation, calling on them to repent. Prayers for their repentance will be answered by God. Now, we don't know timeline for that. Some of you maybe prayed for someone for years that you feel like is a true Christian that you're calling back, right? Um, but what John tells us is he gives us the assurance that if they are a child of God, God will have them. He doesn't lose them. He will have them, right? So pray for that restoration, and God will answer it. One way or another, someday it will be answered. Those are the kind of prayers that God does answer. There's confidence with that. People struggling with sins not unto death, which I might say is eternal damnation. They've given in temptation, and so pray for them. But what about these other ones? What about the ones that lead to death? That's, um, again, one of these kind of abused terms, I think. There's a lot, a lot of thoughts on this one. Probably one of the more, more prominent ones is this, uh, the difference between, like, we make this distinction between mortal and venial sins, right? Um, sins that are terrible. We say, like, like, are, are, uh, mur- like, murder and things like that. We go, oh, these lose you. You, you lose the grace of God, and you, you lose your salvation in those things. But that's a difficult thing to push because the idea of that there being no repentance for that, we've seen a lot of murders in the Bible restored, right? That, that can't, can't quite work. So what do we do? I think our for answer is actually already in First John. I think we've been through it. Do you remember those Antichrists we talked about a couple different times? Remember those ones who um, went out from us but were not from us in 2.19? Those who deny the Son, this is the Antichrist. Remember he says that in 2.22? Those who do not confess Jesus as Lord, 4, 2 through 3? Those people? So I believe what's happening is this is the same sin that we see in Hebrews 6 where the author speaks about those who have in some way experienced the fruit of the gospel and have gone out from us and have, have left it, right? have despised it. In other words, this, this sin unto death in one sense, we could say is apostasy, like true apostasy, right? It's, it's denying the son. It's having tasted the truth, yet denying it regardless. Even it's, even, it's when one hardens his heart to his own damnation. You get this idea of um, a great illustration is probably Pharaoh himself, right? Who, who witnessed the might of Yahweh, right? So, but still hardened his own heart, and then Yahweh hardens it even more. He just continues to go down this path where he cannot see redemption. He cannot see truth. Romans 1 tells us that in mankind's wickedness, God turns him over to the desires of his flesh to his own damnation. In other words, the sin that leads to death is the rejection of God. Just ultimately the hardening of the heart where it's impossible to be restored. And and look, this is complicated stuff to nuance. You kind of got to go some other places and and work some theology out. Um, I'm I'm simplifying it, I know, in a lot of ways. We We can talk more about this later. I think what John is talking about in the context of the letter are these antichrists, those who call God a liar because they don't confess the Son, Christ, as the Son of God. That's the sin that leads to death. And so John, never pursuing to know someone's heart, says, look, 
I mean, I'm not saying don't pray for those people, but maybe what I am saying is let's focus on those people who aren't denying Christ, right? Like maybe let's focus our prayers on those brothers and sisters in Christ who have slumped into sin, who are struggling with temptation, and pray that God restores them. They see that they are their ways and they repent and come back to the fellowship, right? That's kind of what Johnny's doing. I'm not saying don't, but, but what if we focus here? a lot more that can be said for this. It's a sermon for another day, though. We're almost done. Look at me at 18 and 19. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who has been born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. So 18 is a little hairy. I'm going to throw it back up there. 18 is a little hairy, but let me break it down for you. Um, John says that everyone truly born of God eventually returns, right? His life is not defined by sin, but it's defined by repentance. That just makes David a man after God's own heart is not that David doesn't sin. It's that David repents when he's confronted with his sin. That's what makes, like, that's the heart that we're looking for, the circumcised heart, right? And so here's where it gets a little wonky. It says, but he who was born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. Who's the he? Who's the he that's protecting the him? Right? Okay, that's what we have to figure out. Um, then there's two real options here. The first is it's us, as in the prayers of the other Christians, which is right in this immediate context, makes a lot of sense. It protects the brothers and sisters who've fallen into sin because the Lord will hear the prayer and will bring them to restoration. It's a beautiful image. It's a beautiful image of the power of prayer um, for our brothers and sisters in Christ. And, uh, and grammatically, it works, and I think it can be argued well, and, and I like it. The second option is this, which I think fits more in John's theology and the arguments he's made. Because we haven't seen that argument in any John lit- Johannian literature anywhere. But we get it. We get this other theology, which fits the context and the content of John's thinking. The he represents Christ. Right? The he represents Christ. Christ protects his own. That's what John is saying. Christ protects his own. In the same way that Satan asked, remember this Satan, uh, Peter, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. Remember that? And Jesus says, but I've prayed for you. Right? Like, like it's not, I'm not going to let him take you. You're mine. Right? Um, Christ the righteous, as John calls him earlier in this letter, he is our intercessor. He's our mediator. He's our advocate. The advocate mentioned in chapter 2. Remember, he says, if you do sin, you have an advocate, Christ. Right? And so the, I think in the context of the letter, what makes more sense is that John is saying, but those who fall into sin, Right? Look at me at right there. Um, I think I went way ahead right there. Sorry about that. Um, everyone who's been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he, Christ, who was born of God, right, protects him. And the evil one does not touch him. There's really not a place in Scripture where you can argue that we keep the evil one away. It's Christ who keeps the evil one away, right? I mean, so you're going to see how we kind of combine the, this, this theology to kind of understand what we think is happening here. So it's Christ the righteous who protects us, the one born of God who keeps us from the evil one. Even though, look at 19 again, even though we know that we're from God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil, what John says is Christ protects us even though we're in enemy territory. That's what he's saying. Even though the whole power of the evil one surrounds us, Christ protects us. Christ keeps his sheep. And it's a really comforting image. You know, John has spent like, like four, four chapters and maybe like seven verses basically just trying to convince. <clears throat> sorry. Darn it. So close. It's my water. Whenever a pastor would take a sip of water as a kid, I was always jealous. Went to a real tight traditional church and we could never have water in the pews, you know. Why does he get to drink? <clears throat> right? And John's going to spend his whole time building this argument, right, of like his concern is really assurance, like confidence, assurance. Right? That's what he wants you to hear. And, of course, we always say if, if, if someone is looking to learn about the gospel, where do you send them to read? Send them to John's gospel. If you want to learn about Jesus? Go to John's gospel. Like he's going to lay it out for you, right, really clear in a convincing, confident way. And that's what John's concern tends to be, is that the church is is comforted through these letters and stands strong in the face of temptation, in the face of tribulation. Church, John closes his letter with these two verses. And one of them is very seemingly out of place here. Look at me at 20 and 21. 
And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. So John says, we, we know all this to be true because we believe God. We take him at his word. We do not call him a liar. Oh, and by the way, stay away from idols. What a weird ending. Right? I mean, just kind of going through it, it doesn't seem like it fits real well. It just is like this tag, you know, kind of at the end, this kind of add-on. It feels a little Old Testament-y, doesn't it? It's like this Old Testament line, like, stuck in. But it's actually at the heart of the entire letter. Right, what John's been trying to get the reader to do this whole time is to give him assurance and confidence by putting his focus on the true Christ. Right? Stop listening to false prophets and antichrists. They don't have the answer. Stop chasing new ideas. Stop trying to develop these new understandings of salvation. It's really simple. The gospel you once heard is still the same. He says, cling to Christ. Like anything else is idolatry. It's idolatry, right? A worshiping of false God. Even if you call it Christ, yet it's not true to the doctrine of Christ, you've just created a false God that you worship. It's idolatry. And so John, as this whole thing comes to a head, he ends it with a few simple words. Stay away from idols, right? Worship the true Christ. Like, that's what John is trying to get the people to. To do. And that will give them confidence, it will give them assurance, it will give them all those things, as, and us as we deal with the trials and tribulations of this world. 